In this Learn Electrics video, we'll look at some assessment tips and methods on validating R1 plus R2 for ring circuits and proving that the ZS measurements are acceptable. The ability to do this is an essential skill for any good electrician and understanding what you are doing is so important if you are approaching the end of an apprenticeship. For example, when completing your AM1 or AM2 or any other training period, such as testing and inspection courses or initial verification, you will be required to pass an assessment of your abilities. The assessor will be deciding things like, can this person go on site on their own and work safely? Will they complete the allotted work to the required standard? Are they able to test the circuits and complete the paperwork correctly? Can they determine if the test results are valid results? So this video asks, can you validate the R1 plus R2 values that you've just recorded? Do you know what R1 plus R2 should be? Can you calculate it and prove that what you've just measured are the correct numbers? And are you able to talk confidently about the testing procedure and what you've just done? Or... Do you just write down what the meter displays and hope for the best? To begin with, you must know this. Little r1, little rn and little r2 are the end-to-end -end readings of each conductor. Little r is used to indicate this. This is important. It differentiates between the different test results. Little r1 is line, little rn is neutral and little r2 is the CPC. Then we have the big R's. Big R1 plus RN and big R1 plus R2 are the effective resistances that are added to the ZE or ZDB to make ZS. Big R is used for this. In a radial circuit, big R1 plus R2 equals little R1 plus little R2. But in a ring circuit, big R1 plus R2 will be smaller than little R1 plus R2. This is because a ring circuit is a parallel circuit. We want to verify the ring circuit test results. Can we prove that the R1 plus Rn and R1 plus R2 crossover tests are correct and the results are valid? Shown here is a copy of the schedule of test results, the sheet that lists the test result details. We need to find the required data for the ring circuit which happens to be circuit number one. This data has been highlighted by the red box. What is it that we need to do? We want to prove that this number, 0 0.33 ohms, is correct for the values that we've recorded for the line, neutral and CPC end-to-end -end resistances. Many of us will call the CPC the earth, but in an assessment, don't do this. Some assessors are very picky and insist that we use the correct terms, in this case CPC, the Circuit Protective Conductor. It's actually very easy to prove the numbers if you know the correct formulas to use, and that is easy too. Write down the test results as we know them, little r1, rn and r2. Now use the following two formulas, big r1 plus big rn is equal to little r1 plus little rn and then divide this by 4. With our example, this gives a value of 0 0.25 ohms. And for big r1 plus big r2, we have little r1 plus little r2 divided by 4. This is 0 0.3325 here, which we can round down to 0 0.33 ohms. And we'll look at these in more detail soon and do ensure that little r and big r are used in the right places. First, a refresher on ring circuit testing. You need to know this. Your assessor may ask questions to test your knowledge and understanding. You must know how to do the ring circuit tests in an assessment. These are basic testing skills, and you are expected to know them. We'll begin with end-to-end -end testing of little r1, little rn and little r2 and you must always carry out safe isolation 
before beginning any of these tests. Forget to do safe isolation or make a mess of it and you will fail the assessment. Forget to do safe isolation on site and you might end up dead. If you can't do it, if you're rusty, start practicing now. At the consumer unit, we must separate the six conductors that make up the ring circuit. If it's twin and earth cable, we'll have an A cable and a B cable. If they are singles, we must find which three wires belong to one set, the A's, and which three to the other set, the B's. I then fasten them together as separate sets with a cable tie. Now low ohms test between the two line conductors to get little r1 shown here as 0 0.5 ohms. Then test little rn between the two neutral conductors and you should get 0 0.5 ohms again. It's the same size copper as the line and going to the same places. So it should, within reason, be the same value. Now test R2, the CPC conductor. This is smaller in cross-sectional area than the line, so its resistance value should be higher. If this is 2.5 by 1.5 twin and earth, the CPC ohms value should be about 1.67 times greater than the line or neutral resistances. This table shows how we get the ratios of line to CPC resistances for different size twin and earth cable. Find the twin and earth that you are testing and the rightmost column gives the multiplication factor to use. Whatever the line reading is, multiply it by this factor to find the expected CPC value. To use our current example, if a 2.5 mm line measures 0 0.5 ohms, the CPC will be 0 0.5 multiplied by 1.67 which is 0 0.83 ohms. And if a 10 mm line measures 0 0.3 ohms, the CPC will be 0 0.3 multiplied by 2.5 to give us 0 0.75 ohms. All we have done is divided the line size by the CPC size to get the multiplication factor. This works for any sizes of conductor. Now we can test for big R1 plus big Rn, the effective resistance of the line and neutral as a parallel pair of conductors. We must cross connect the line and neutral wires at the consumer unit. Using jumper wires, crocodile clips, chop blocks or wagos, link cable A line to cable B neutral. Then link cable A neutral to cable B line. Get them the wrong way round and the test results will be all over the place. Now, forget about the consumer unit and go to the sockets. Carry out a low resistance ohms test at each socket between line and neutral. Record as you go and use the highest value in ohms as you test each socket. If your meter has a test lead with a three pin plug on the end, it won't do this test without you repositioning the jack plugs in the back of the test meter for each test. Far better, I think, to use the leads with a 4mm jack plug on each end and a socket test adapter. Using a socket test adapter is the safest method for testing. No need to open sockets and expose live wiring and is quick and easy to move between sockets. Inserting the end-to-end -end test results for little R1 and Rn into the formula, we should expect our test meter to return similar readings of about 0 0.25 ohms. By doing this calculation, we are double checking that the readings are correct and also checking that the circuit is wired correctly. Big R1 plus Rn readings should be almost the same across all the sockets. For example, 0 0.25 ohms, 0 0.25 ohms, 0 0.24 ohms, and we choose the highest value as the big R1 plus Rn value. By selecting the highest reading, we are using the worst case example. If the worst case readings are acceptable, then all the lower value readings will be acceptable too. We are looking for a balanced circuit. If all the readings are the same, within a very small margin of tolerance, then we can be fairly confident that all is okay with the circuit so far. 
Another example, and with readings in balance, is shown in the green box. All the readings are hovering around 0 0.5 ohms, nothing to worry about here. But the yellow box shows a circuit with problems. One of the readings is quite clearly out of balance with the others. At 0 0.9 ohms, when all the others are about 0 0.5 ohms, something is wrong with the cabling to that socket or the socket itself. And we need to investigate and resolve the problem before moving on. If all is OK, we can now move on to measuring big R1 plus big R2. This figure is recorded on the schedule of test results and it is important to get it right. Return to the consumer unit and this time we must cross connect the line and CPC conductors. Link cable A line to cable B CPC and link cable A CPC to cable B line. Now test at the sockets. Low resistance test at each socket line to earth and record the highest ohms value as R1 plus R2 on the schedule of test results. We can use E for earth now because we are talking about the termination at the plug face. By making the calculation as shown here we can confirm that 0 0.33 ohms is the test result to be expected. We already know little r1 and little r2 from the end to end tests so we add these together and divide by 4. The answer when rounded down is big R1 plus big R2 is 0 0.33 ohms. If your test results are close to the calculated figures then we know that this part of the circuit is correct. Now we prove that the ZS loop impedance figure that you've recorded is correct for this ring circuit. Measuring ZS or loop impedance or earth fault loop impedance as it's called is a live test. If you're asked to test ZS, then take suitable precautions to keep yourself and others safe. If we look at the top of the test results details sheet, we have a line for ZDB. This is the ZD for this consumer unit, 0 0.21 ohms. There's a reason for it being called ZDB, which is explained in another video. We know that ZS equals ZE plus R1 plus R2 and this formula should be permanently stamped in your memory. For this example take the 0 0.21 ohms for ZDB and add it to the 0 0.33 ohms for R1 plus R2 from the test results page. 0 0.21 plus 0 0.33 is 0 0.54 ohms and that is the ZS for this circuit. We should compare this now to the maximum permitted ZS that we found in table B6 of the on-site guide and also written on the circuit details sheet as shown here. I always quote from the on-site guide so I always make it very obvious to any reader of my test data that this is an 80% figure taken from the on-site guide and not the 100% figure from the regs book. Maximum permitted ZS is 1.1 ohms and we've measured and calculated ZS to be 0.54 ohms. This is a good result. 0.54 ohms is less than 1.1 ohms so ZS is acceptable. And a quick reminder of those formulas. The end-to-end -end resistances are written with little r's. Little r1, little rn and little r2. The effective resistances are parallel resistances for a ring circuit and are written with big R's. Memorize the three formulas shown here before your assessment. The best way to learn these is practice over and over again. And then some more. Make up some numbers for little r1, rn and r2 and do the calculations for big R1 plus R2 and big R1 plus rn. Practice makes perfect, and perfect impresses the assessor. And finally, good luck. Thank you for watching, it really is appreciated. Please subscribe to our channel to get access to all of our videos, and remember to click on notify to be sure of not missing our next video.
and you will find even more information, videos and help on our website at learnelectrics.com. And don't forget, you can also type in Learn Electrics, all one word, into the YouTube search bar to go directly to our channel at any time from any computer. We are constantly adding new videos to our channel, so don't miss the next one. And once again, thank you for watching, and we hope to see you again very soon.